We've seen the core library behind Spark. We've seen some distribution. Now, let's see how we can monitor and maintain our Spark applications using a tool called the Spark UI. But before we can do that, we need to set up the browser to handle the proxy that we created when SSHing in the last section. I will follow the instructions as set forth in the Amazon Docs for Google Chrome. First, install a proxy add-on named Foxy Proxy, the standard edition. Once installed, we need to create an XML file containing the proxy settings. Especially note that the port must match the one we entered when we ran our SSH command. The contents of this file can be found in the Amazon documentation, but should also be included in the exercise files for this module. Once created, click on the Foxy Proxy shortcut and choose Options. Then go to the Import Export section, click on Choose File, and choose the XML file that you just created, clicking Replace when prompted. And finally, change the proxy mode to use proxies based on their predefined patterns and priorities. With the browser set up, we can take a look at some of the features that the Spark UI provides us. But how is the UI even created? Here, I've spun up the Spark shell again and run a few actions so that we'll have something to look at in the UI. You'll notice that in the output, it announces that the Spark UI will be available at the following address. By default, every Spark context spins up its own Spark UI at port 4040. If that port isn't available, it'll continuously increment that number until it finds an open port. Also, the URL listed can be replaced by the one provided in the export from the last section. Otherwise, it would have used the private local host and wouldn't have been accessible at all. However, even with that setup, the 4040 address ends up not loading properly due to the AWS proxying and a bug in the way Hadoop's proxies are handled. Normally, going to the 4040 based address will work. Although, in this scenario, there is a workaround where we can go through another port made available in this specific setup, port 20. 888. Following that with a slash proxy slash application ID, where application ID can be found the same way as we mentioned in the last section. At the end of this section, we'll see a third, simpler way that doesn't require knowing the application ID. Now that we have the UI loading properly, we see a list of all the jobs submitted. Recall that a job is triggered every time an action is called which is why the description is the action that triggered the job. Each job shows when it was submitted and how long it took to run, or how long it's been running if it has yet to complete. We can also see how many stages and tasks there are for this job, where a stage is a grouping of RDD transformations that can all be completed without having to shuffle or reference data from other partitions and tasks are the actual functions executed on each partition. All of our jobs are complete. However, this UI will show the current progress of any non-completed job also, allowing you to track their course. Note that the for each job has some skipped work, which is just saying that the data did not need to be computed as the results were still available from one of our prior job runs. Also notice that each job has a link which can take us one level deeper into the job's information. Where we can see the discrete stages for the job. This time the description is based off of the last RDD operation that can be executed before a shuffle is required. In fact, as of Spark 1.4, we can even get a decent visualization of the DAG and how the different transformations are staged by clicking the DAG visualization link. This shows us that the two make RDD calls ran separately, after which a new stage ran the join, map, and filter, all before finally hitting the action of collect. This page also provides a means to see the call stack at each stage break via the details link, and an insight into the in and out data usage at each stage. If the stage is active, then following the details link would be another one to kill the stage, 
which, after verifying your intent, will end the running stage, which will end the running job. If we click on a stages link, then we're taken even further into the stages section, filtered based on the stage we clicked on. Here, you're given even more detail, such as the duration of the stage, as well as how much time was spent on garbage collection, and how much data was shuffled. This information becomes more granular as you go down the page, displaying the task level details, including where the task was run. Note that there's a difference between duration and task time. Duration is often referred to as the wall clock time, as it's the time it took the stage's entire set of tasks to complete. Task time is the total CPU time that was used, added up across the entire distribution. And looking at the DAG visualization again, here it shows how each transformation breaks down at the discrete RDD level. That's all the information the UI shows on execution details, but there's much more instrumentation to be had. The next section is the storage section. Here we can see any RDDs that have been persisted. Take note that if you don't set your name via RDD's set name method, then the name is just a standard default. Past that, we can see what type of storage level was used for persisting the RDD, and then how many partitions the RDD is broken into, as well as what percentage of the RDD was cached, as it's possible for only part of the RDD to fit into storage. Then, we'll of course want to see how much memory the RDD takes up. And if we click on the RDD link, we're given an even more granular view of our stored RDD. The next section provides us with an abundance of settings, ranging from the JVM runtimes used to all of the Spark properties used to spin up the context, at least those that aren't hard-coded defaults. Then we're provided with the master's system properties. This merely makes a call to Java's system.getPropertiesMethod method filtering out the Java class path and Spark properties, which provides a decent view of the master. And the last piece of information exposed here is all of the class paths that were loaded, along with whether the class path originated from the system settings or if it was user added. Now, the final section we'll review is the executor section, which primarily displays information about all of the machines on the cluster, including the driver denoted by the ID being the driver instead of a number. This is a snapshot of the machine states with respect to Spark, containing information on each executor's RDD storage and its task history, including how much data was read from input or shuffled around. Then, if there's log files on the executor, you're given access to their output directly in the UI. Although, in the AWS case, these logs are located at the private address of the machine, so we're relegated to using the SSH method of viewing the logs that we learned in the last section. Otherwise, the UI is a much easier way to view this output. And, as of 1.2, if the Spark context running the UI is still up and running, then you can get a thread dump of the current state of execution. This can be useful for more in-depth tuning or debugging efforts. So, what if the Spark context isn't running any longer. Like if we submit a Spark job to run to completion and exit. If the UI is run by the context, then how will we be able to review our completed jobs? Spark has a solution for that in the form of the Spark history server. If you're using Spark standalone, then you can simply use its built-in UI at port 8080. But if using Yarn or Mesos, then the history server can be started via a script in the sbin directory named starthistoryserver.sh. Once started, it'll be at port 18080. The history server provides a means to view the UI for completed applications, where the UI should be the same, except the thread dump option won't be available due to this being a snapshot of a completed application. However, notice that there's a link for incomplete applications. Remember at the beginning of the section that I said there would be a simpler way to view a running context UI than having to know the application ID, at least in this AWS YARN scenario. Well, here it is. 
Simply go to the history server at port 18080, click on incomplete applications, and you're taken to the same UI we looked at before. That's a whirlwind tour of the Spark UI basics, of which we only reviewed a portion, so feel free to dig in on your own, especially as it can be quite useful and is continuously being improved. And, as mentioned in the last section, don't forget to spin down your AWS cluster once you're done, to avoid any unnecessary costs.